I'm going to talk about hematopoietic stem cell gene therapy for primary immune deficiencies. Uh, my conflict of interest statement, I'm an inventor on the work I'll talk about, uh, patented by the University of California Regents, and this intellectual property was licensed to Orchard Therapeutics, the work on ADA SCID. I'm also on the scientific advisory boards listed there, including Orchard Therapeutics. And some of the preliminary clinical trial results I'll show are from ongoing studies and not final results. So among the different white cells, there are immune deficiencies involving most of them. And I will talk today about work we've done on adenosine deaminase, or ADA-deficient SCID. This was with a CIRM grant and in collaboration with Orchard Therapeutics. Uh, I won't talk about other than to mention right now that we're also doing trials for neutrophil defects, X-linked chronic granulomatous disease under a CIRM CLIN2, and that was just published in Nature Medicine, and also leukocyte adhesion deficiency under a different CIRM grant to Rocket Pharma. So ADA deficiency is illustrated here, the, the biochemistry. The enzyme ADA deaminates adenosine or deoxyadenosine to make inosine or deoxyadenosine, which can then either be uh, excreted ultimately as uric acid or salvaged. And it turns out that in the absence of ADA enzyme genetic deficiency, it was observed that ADA enzymes were missing in a skid patient that led to the suggestion it could be involved in the disease. And we now know that in the absence of ADA, high levels of the nucleoside that build up are phosphorylated, especially in lymphocytes, to deoxyadenosine triphosphate. And this is what's lymphotoxic, kills off the immune system, and leads to ADA skid. So ADA skid is about 10 to 15 percent of all human skid. And our estimate is that there's about 10 children a year born with that between the U.S. and Canada. And of the different forms of skid, it's the first one where the human where the biochemical and genetic bases were determined. Um, and we know that ADA-deficient skid patients have profound panlymphopenia, meaning they have low levels of T, B, and NK lymphocytes from these accumulated lymphotoxic adenine metabolites I just showed you. And there are several therapeutic options for these patients, including allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplant, either from a matched sibling or matched family donor, or from a matched unrelated donor, or from a haploidentical, usually a, a parent donor. Um, and then what I'll talk about today is autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplant with gene therapy. And there's also an enzyme replacement therapy for ADA skid where bovine ADA is conjugated to polyethylene glycol and can be given as repeated um, injections. Uh, but for the gene therapy that, that I'll talk about, the schema is shown here. So in our study, we used bone marrow as the source of hematopoietic stem cells. They were harvested from the patient in the operating room taken to the GMP laboratory, where we enriched for the CD34 fraction. We then used a lentiviral vector to add a normal ADA gene. The cells were then formulated and certified. During this time, the patients received some cytoreductive chemotherapy to make space for the stem cells, which are then reinfused intravenously. And then we followed the patients for the different um, endpoints of the study for safety, for the clinical outcomes, measuring the gene frequency, gene expression, and looking at the vector integration sites. So this is our, our, our lifetime total work on ADA skid uh, patients with gene therapy. We treated three patients in the early 90s using their umbilical cord blood that really didn't bring any efficacy. Then we did studies over about a decade using a, a gamma retroviral vector. And then in, in 2013, we opened up our trials using the EFS ADA lentiviral vector that I'll talk about today and that has been licensed to Orchard Therapeutics. So this is a map of the vector, and it shows that it's a relatively simple vector carrying a normal human ADA cDNA that's been coded and optimized to improve translation. It uses the elongation factor, short promoter, has a WPRE to stabilize the message, and that's the transcript it made. This vector was made by colleagues in, in University College London, Adrian Thrasher and Bobby Gaspar, and then we together have studied it. And so there were parallel trials in the UK in the U.S. using this vector uh, to treat patients with ADA skid. I'll talk about our studies, the initial trial using fresh cells, then a follow-up study using cryopreserved cells. And there's just a picture of uh, Bobby Gaspar and Adrian Thrasher, our colleagues. And so for the fresh trial, this is the schema that the patients followed. So following consent and screening studies, they would be admitted like on a Monday. Tuesday morning, they'd go to the operating room for a bone marrow harvest and placement of a PICC line. We isolate the stem cells in the laboratory and then do the lentivirus transduction or the gene transfer over a two-day period. 
Uh, during that time, they'd get a single dose of chemotherapy to make space. And then on Thursday, they'd get the cells reinfused. And then if all went well, one month later, we'd stop their enzyme therapy and then follow their immune reconstitution. And we enrolled and treated 20 patients under this schema between 2013 and 2015. And these are some of the results from the, the study. These are our uh, interim trial results and not, not fully uh, validated data. But it shows that the patients went from having basically no ADA in their red cells due to their ADA deficiency to on average levels of ADA that were above the normal range that were really quite stable and sustained over the two years of follow-up. The uh, bad metabolites that accumulate in their red blood cells were down until we stopped their enzyme therapy. It came back up, but then over time, they came back down, showing the effects of the ADA expression. And then their T cells also dropped after stopping their enzyme that was keeping them alive. But then the T cells came back up into a, a therapeutic range. And the same thing with B cells. So based on these positive results, we actually applied to the FDA for orphan drug designation, which was granted in October 2014. We also applied for and received breakthrough therapy designation and then licensed this to Orchard uh, Therapeutics in February 2016. So then going forward from that point, uh, we developed a new clinical trial, um, and this was uh, funded by CIRM and uh, Orchard Therapeutics, and it was designed to assess a cryopreserved cell product. So rather than giving the cells fresh to the patient, we froze them at the end. We enrolled uh, 10 patients in the study, completing all follow-up by September 2019. And the advantage of a cryopreserved product, among others, would that it would allow administration at the local pediatric transplant center rather than within a few blocks of our cell processing laboratory as the FRESH requires. So we call this the frozen trial for the frozen cells. And now the schema was a little more complicated for the patients, so we dissociated collection and transplant. So they'd come in for the bone marrow harvest, and the same process was used to add the gene, but then the cells were frozen. And then we could take the time we needed to certify the cells to make sure they were sterile, had adequate vector company, all the other uh, endpoints of the certificate of analysis. Then the patients would come back in for a second admission and would receive their chemotherapy now split and adjusted to hit the right total level. Then the cells were thawed and given back and again followed for 30 days, stopping their enzyme and then looking for immune reconstitution. So this just shows the enrollment for the study. So by the time we got it started, we'd already had a backlog of patients referred. So we treated all 10 plant patients within about eight months. Red is the one we did their bone marrow harvest. Green is when they got their transplant. This one patient actually did not, we did not recover adequate cells from one harvest. So we did a second harvest. And ultimately, she went on to not engraft. So she's our only patient that it needed to go on to an allogeneic transplant because of the gene therapy didn't work. So we transplanted these 10 patients and infected two more um, uh, in an expanded access program. And this is just the people in my group that did all those cell processing. And that's a lot of, that's a lot of cell processing to do in, the, in that course, and they were great. And so we, we presented uh, with Orchard at the 2019 ASH meeting a comparison of the outcomes for multiple parameters, the two most important ones are shown here, between the fresh cells and the total and the, uh, the cryopreserved cells, or them all added together. And you can see that they're basically indistinguishable. And so the frozen cells gave us the same granulocyte vector copy number as a measure of stem cell engraftment and the same lymphocyte recovery kinetics. And so this allowed then the, this, the two uh, trials to be uh, put together for subsequent um, analyses. And the next analysis that was done by Orchard was to acquire data for a comparator group uh, for the FDA. And so they licensed data from two major centers that treat a lot of SCID patients, Duke University in the U.S. and Great Ormond Street Hospital in, in the U.K. And from them, there were 26 ADA SCID patients who had allogeneic transplant between 2010 and 2016, so a relatively contemporaneous group. 12 of them received transplants from match-related donors and 14 from non-match-related donors. So the 12 that got match-related donor, uh, 11 used bone marrow and no condition was given before the transplant, sort of the classical way of transplanting skid patients with a sibling match. One of them, there was a cord blood and they got only serotherapy. So really no marrow cytoreduction reduction for those patients. The 14 that got the non-match-related donor transplants, nine of them were haplos, they were parental uh, transplants. And then the other five were matched unrelated to mobilized peripheral blood and three cord blood. The nine haplos got no conditioning, 
the uh, five unrelated donors got a variety of both cytoablative as well as immune suppressive chemotherapies. And this group of patients matched the gene therapy cohort for agent diagnosis and treatment and for the CD34 cell doses delivered. And so the first uh, comparison was for overall survival. So the blue line are the gene therapy patients or OTL101, and there were no deaths in this group, 100% survival. Whereas in the transplant groups, there were three deaths. Uh, one of the match-related donor from a sibling had a late death from graft-versus-host disease, and two of the non-related uh, donor transplants also died shortly after transplant. And we also looked at event-free survival, where an event is defined as either death or failure of the immune reconstitution so that an allogeneic transplant or enzyme therapy were needed. And so as I mentioned before, one of our patients did not engraft and needed a transplant, whereas in the uh, allo transplant patients, there were, there were a total of 10 events um, and, and four um, in, the, in the match or later where they needed either a rescue transplant to go back on enzyme and six in the non-match related donor group. So the gene therapy was statistically better than uh, transplant for event-free survival. And then finally, we looked at uh, parameters of immune reconstitution. And so red blood cell ADA was higher in the gene therapy group than in the uh, transplant uh, patients. Those who got no condition who basically developed no stem cell engraftment, so no ADA-containing red cells were produced. Metabolites went down in all the patients were actually lowest throughout with the gene therapy group. Uh, CD3 positive T cells came up to a higher level in the gene therapy group, as did naive T cells, suggesting ongoing T cell production. Uh, B cell counts also came up to a higher level after gene therapy than after the allo transplants. And in fact, because of better B cell engraftment or, or development, more of the gene therapy patients, uh, three out of 29 only, were, were still on immunoglobulin replacement at two years. And so 89% of the gene therapy patients were off immunoglobulin, whereas only 70% were the sibling transplants. And I just wanted to close by mentioning that, obviously, the work we're doing is presented by CIRM. And over the last 12 years or so of CIRM, we've had many grants, starting with maybe grant number five from CIRM, a training grant, then grants for the specific trials that I've mentioned. And we've also collaborated on many other grants throughout UCLA, UC Irvine, UCSD, UCSF, UC Berkeley. And most importantly, we've had 10 CIRMS Bridges students in our labs over the last 10 years. And so uh, I just want to thank the patients. Uh, some of them are, some of our graduates are shown here at various times after gene therapy. And thank my lab that did all the work that I showed you. Uh, they're working on vectors and editing and clinical work. Our support at UCLA is from multiple um, institutions, including the Broad Stem Cell Center and the Alpha Stem Cell Clinic. The ADA work that I talked about over the, the decades has been funded by multiple sources, most recently CIRM and Orchard Therapeutics. And this is a list of our collaborators. Thank you. <music>